In my first Don Juan video, I observed how that by exploring other cultures, we burrow beneath ideology and come to understand the common denominators of all cultures, the characteristics that all people share in common. I told how I had been given a copy of the teachings of Don Juan, but when I read it, it sounded strangely familiar. For example, he talked of the Sitio, the place where an individual feels most comfortable and at ease. To me, that equated to a favourite chair. I've always had a favourite chair, and so do most people. The following quote from A Separate Reality illustrates another characteristic that people have in common. Someday, perhaps you'll be able to see other people in a different mode. What's this other mode of seeing, Don Juan? People look different when you see. The little smoke will help you see men as fibres of light. Fibres of light? Yes, fibres like white cobwebs. Very fine threads that circulate from the head to the navel. Thus a person looks like an egg of circulating fibres. And the arms and legs are like luminous bristles bursting out in all directions. Is that the way everyone looks? Everyone. Besides, everyone is in touch with everything else, not through the hands, but through a bunch of long fibres that shoot out from the centre of the abdomen. These fibres join a person to the surroundings. They keep his balance. They give him stability. So as you may see some day, a man is a luminous egg, whether he's a beggar or a king, and there is no way to change it. I knew what he was talking about because I had had experience of my own fibres shooting out from my abdomen without realising. One day at medical school, there was an expedition one Saturday to climb Loch Nagar, organised by a member of the class. All the others, aware of the possible dangers, were kitted out in boots and anoraks. Not being in the habit of climbing mountains in such a literal sense, I did not possess such gear and went in my ordinary clothes as if bound for a lecture. If the weather was bad, I planned to merely sit in the bus and wait while the others clambered. But the weather was fine. I consciously and deliberately relaxed into the ascent, and to my amazement, my feet easily found footholds on the steep rocky path. Intoxicated by the sensation, I left the others behind and had climbed to the summit at over 4,000 feet and back in next to no time. Looking back on the event, it was as if my fibres had grasped the rocks, pulling me gently up step by step to the summit and then lowered me back to the bus. I was later reminded of the event when I read, in a separate reality, of Don Gennaro crossing the waterfall. There is a picture of him doing it on the cover. On another occasion, I arm-wrestled a beefy lumberjack from New Zealand who was a mature student in the class. I was only a nine-stone weekly. I won, and he was flabbergasted. People talk of reality as if it were a single entity, but for all individuals there are two realities. There is the reality of the world around them, or objective reality, and there is the reality of the inner world, the world of thoughts, feelings and imagination, or subjective reality. To understand Castaneda, it is necessary to realise that the subject of reality of that inner world is a scientific reality, as immense and as important as the reality of the world around us. After all, the mind can conceive of and dream to infinity. It is in this world where all the events described by Castaneda take place. For most people, most of the time, that inner reality is preoccupied by hopes, fears, jealousies, grievances, boredom and such like. Indeed, teenage youth is beset by the anxieties associated with learning to be men, a 
acquiring a skill, getting a job, finding a wife, buying a house, raising a family, and generally making their way. I once heard these distractions referred to as the chattering apes of consciousness, a homely preoccupation which precluded worldly thought. I was able to break the habit myself as a chance consequence of stumbling upon the routine of systematic relaxation that I have described in my first meditation video. You can find it down there somewhere. At first, systematic relaxation is difficult because of the distractions caused by chattering apes. The secret of exploring subjective reality is to sedate those apes by seeing them in the broader perspective of one's life. Are petty worries and anxieties really that important or is indulging them merely a habit? Once you've disciplined the apes, you will begin to feel your fibres crackle. This can be accomplished without drugs of any kind, not even a joint or a cup of coffee. I later learned that the energy from the fibres is capable of the most precise control, although I never explored this phenomenon personally. In 1976, an old patient called on me. He was studying Chinese martial arts including Tai Chi. Chi is the Chinese term for the energy that flows along the meridians and out through a spot on the abdomen similar to the fibres described by Don Juan. By studying Tai Chi, it is possible to acquire control over the energy and direct it where you will. In its cruder form, Kung Fu freaks use it to chop bricks in half. So here you have two identical ways of understanding energy deduced in ancient times by different cultures totally remote from each other. In the final analysis, the new frontier is the exploration of inner space. It is the ultimate source of energy and only chattering apes are preventing progress. If you want to learn more about Tai Chi, the websites of two old friends are in the sidebar. Parkour, free running and break dancing videos vividly illustrate how people can grasp the world with their fibres or their cheek.